O oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. When we think of agriculture in America, the desert isn't the first place that comes to mind. But the Southwest continues to surprise and delight. We're really you know, fortunate in Arizona that we have a year-round growing season. A lot of other places in the country, you know, you can't grow food in the winter. We have citrus, greens, lots of amazing root vegetables, carrots and beets, potatoes. In the summer too, we do have an amazing rainy season that allows us to grow tomatoes and tomatillos and eggplant and okra and so many amazing things. Indeed, Arizona remains a top state for vegetable and melon production. And in the semi-arid Tucson Basin, people have been cultivating food for the past 4,000 years. Growing food in the desert is just overwhelmingly difficult as it is. You know, we have plenties of struggles with just it being extremely hot, but also lack of water. Arizona is in the midst of a population boom, and that, combined with the effects of the changing climate and extended droughts, has caused additional strain on their water supply. Cities are now turning to agricultural water sources, adding to the challenges farmers have faced for generations. I think anybody that's participating in agriculture down here is really doing something pretty amazing. I could have never imagined the reach that we have. We distribute to restaurants, households, schools, hospitals, and kitchens just all across the city and uh, southern Arizona. It's grown really naturally along with the kind of group of growers that we started with. I'm really proud of, of the kind of growth that we've seen generally in the kind of base of agriculture in southern Arizona, which when we started was, um, unfortunately, we were seeing a lot of farms close. Growth for small farms means growth for small businesses, especially in Tucson, where restaurateurs know their farmers by name and everybody knows Eric. Here you go, Brian. Oh, let us see what we have. Kale from IRC New Roots. Nice. So what's coming up? Lots more citrus, lots more greens. We're in winter. We're drowning in citrus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got tangelos. Did you? Mm -hmm. I ate all the blood oranges that we didn't sell. <laughs> Why didn't I sell? Because <laughs> I ate them all. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> when Pivot gives you lemons. <laughs> we make lemonade? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> lemonade and so much more. The idea for Pivot Produce came to Eric Sanford while working in the kitchen at Five Points Market. He started getting really frustrated ordering produce from so many small farms, right? Like if you need 12 pounds of kale total and you can get four from Rattlebox and four from Forever Young and four from wherever, he was like at the farmer's market picking up part of our weekly order from a bunch of different farms. And he was like, man, if only there was someone that could do this for me. I've been a line cook since I was 15 years old. Landed at five points at some point on that journey and through conversations with Brian, developed an idea that which we needed to have more access to the produce that we were seeing at the farmer's markets. And then through talking to farmers that uh, farmers really needed a wholesale outlet. The product you may receive from a traditional wholesaler likely was harvested anywhere from, you know, eight days to three months ago. The produce that we're distributing was harvested two to three days before it gets delivered. I had a 1987 uh, station wagon that I would load with large amounts of vegetables at the time, but compared to what we do now, it really was, was not much. And, you know, I would drive out to farms, uh, Marana, Cochise County, bring it all back here, organize it in a garage with a couple of refrigerators and distribute it. It's actually branching into Northern Arizona, like Sedona, Flagstaff for greater crop availability in those months that are more difficult um, for growing. So maybe we can have some some lettuce in the summer. <laughs> when you actually start working with seasonal food, I think you learn a, about, a lot about what grows really well in your region um, and why it's you know unique to the place that you're creating a menu. It's interesting working with the seasons here. We can pretty much only grow nightshades and cucurbits in the summer. So, you know, we've had a small little farm of our own for a few years and our first our first planting was with monsoon rains in the summer and we accidentally grew 600 pounds of cucumbers and 600 pounds of melons. Harvested at the same time, like mm -hmm. ready to go. We were making lots of melon juice. Brian and Jasper of Five Points Market and Restaurant in Tucson are well accustomed to making the best of whatever comes their way. And when we say the best, we mean the best. Yeah, this is the dish that kind of made us famous. It was mentioned in the New York Times when we first opened. I don't think we're famous. Not famous. <laughs> uh, but I think that that article did like kind yeah. of make it, us. It propelled a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's when we went from a couple of servers and three cooks to 
A bunch of people we didn't know helping us do things. <laughs> <laughs> the dish that made them famous? Huevos Rancheros. Sometimes people from away struggle with this dish and I'll offer them a side of sour cream. I'm not um, struggling. Good, it's like a local local level of heat. I, yeah. I think some people maybe just don't eat right. chili peppers very often. Yeah. But then the avocado is nice and cool. Right, it cuts through it, cheese cuts through it, the beans balance. aren't spicy, yeah. the tortillas aren't spicy. And you got the, state, the saltiness of the cheese and the fat kind of to block a little of that heat. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's perfect. Jasper and Brian moved to Tucson with no plans to open a restaurant. But they had both worked in the service industry and shared a passion for well-crafted food, natural wines, and cocktails. Legend has it, when the town baker who supplied Five Points with their bread and pastries decided to shut down shop, Jasper taught herself how to make what would become Tucson's most coveted baked goods overnight. I was just like, I'll figure it out. <laughs> and I did. And Maybe since then... <laughs> some of it was done in our kitchen at home. <laughs> I didn't go to culinary school. We both worked in restaurants and everything that we've created on our menu here is a result of that experience and just putting flavors together that we enjoy. Some of the menu is designed around, you know, trying to, to hit all the marks, like where someone who might have food allergies or mm -hmm. dietary restrictions could eat good food. We work exclusively with organically grown products. The growers don't necessarily need to be certified organic, um, but they do need to commit to not using pesticides on their products, um, and that's something that our customers drive. The demand is to have an organic and natural product. When we started, our menu only had five items on it, and it was just really simple. In general, our menu has mostly stayed the same and reacted to seasons. The connection to actual seasonality, of course, you know, farm to table has been this big move in everywhere. Kind of trying to maintain the like casual brunch vibe with seasonal produce and fresh ideas. Fresh ideas, like the one Brian and Chef Ken Gillian dreamed up for what is arguably one of America's best sandwiches. It's a pretty simple sandwich. We have a smoker <laughs> and we smoke beets. And then it has a jalapeno cabbage slaw so um, and a local pecan puree. It's on house made organic ciabatta. This is so good. This is such an unusual flavor combination. But it's just perfect. It's like hitting every tone. This is the smoked salmon benedict. It's like nostalgically the perfect thing to eat while drinking a glass of Prosecco. House smoked salmon from Knack Knack Family Fisheries in Alaska. Caramelized onion and mustard potato pancake and then some local greens in a house vinaigrette with shaved root vegetables. I think the, the breakfast toast is an unsung hero. Mm -hmm. This has a boring name, that's mm -hmm. why. We've got barrio bread, barrio heritage heritage grain bread. Pesto shove, so uh, just like a very simple olive oil basil folded into uh, soft milk cheese. Mm -hmm. And then a Chianti wine jelly atop the eggs, which um, the balance of the, the sweet and the salt is, is really lovely. Um, not the most camera ready. It's not yeah. ugly, it's the most beautiful breakfast toast I've ever seen. This kind of fare is what makes Five Points Market and Restaurant Tucson's go-to for Sunday brunch, where finding a table can be like winning the lottery. But no amount of popularity could protect them from the effects of a global pandemic. We completely closed to the public for 18 months. The last few weeks have been my first few weeks really back on the floor, and I just keep seeing people that I haven't seen in three years who have been here supporting us the whole time, and it's yeah. like, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's a little emotional. We worked really hard the last few years to make a lot less money. <laughs> and uh, keeping keeping our staff like healthy, motivated, and around was a lot. But we stayed open as an online grocery store, an online restaurant. Our servers were um, our delivery drivers. We put everything online, all of our entrees, and then we took what is kind of a humble little market with a lot of thoughtfully curated goods and wine, and we really bolstered the grocery aspect of it. Pre-COVID, we were a business and we operated like what I called it was wholesale or no sale. We didn't, you know, go to farmer's markets. We didn't deliver to individuals. We just were business to business, right? When all the restaurants closed, we lost 95% of our business kind of in a weekend. Um, that included Five Points and some others. People were stuck in their homes and farmers were stuck with a bunch of extra produce, not to mention seeds in the ground for the next season. 
it was a new problem in need of a new solution. So I think I had a couple beers and I sat down at the kitchen table with my wife and we decided to launch a home delivery um, kind of CSA style business. I set the website up, I launched it, I said 100 customers is about all we can handle. I accidentally put an extra zero on it and we had 350 people sign up in 24 hours. So the next morning had to figure out how we were gonna to deliver to 350 homes all across the city. And now we delivered 500 CSA style bags every week. Yeah. Sustainability, first and foremost for me, comes down to like, is this sustainable for my body and my brain? <laughs> like, um, and so sustainability for us has actually looked like slowing down. And that so relates to how we work with local farms too. I mean, if we wanna just continue to grow and grow and grow, we won't be able to source all of our food locally. It's really important to us that through this whole supply chain, that the individuals that are you know, growing and producing this food are treated equitably as well. So we're talking about not just the farm owner, but the farm worker, not just the restaurant owner, but the line cook, and not just me as a business owner, but the folks that, that work in here and process all the amazing food. We're passionate about this industry, and hospitality is something we really care about. When we opened, we were like, we didn't know what we were doing or how it would work. This chance to slow down in the last two years has really helped us like remember like sustainability isn't just about like ordering from our farmers. It's about like making the world a better place. We just really wanted to prove that it is possible to pay people a living wage, and it is possible to work with local sustainable farms, and it's possible to put a better product out there and have just kind of, yeah, a healthier, a healthier work environment for everyone involved. So Brian and Jasper really took me under their wing when I was, you know, I was pretty young, a line cook, you know, but I was working for them and I was working really hard, and, and they kind of identified that and, and found opportunities, you know, within their community for me and we have been a huge support since Pivot fell out of my head and, and we started doing that. So they're a huge part of my community and Pivot has become a huge part of their community, I think, as well. I love this place. Every time I'm in Tucson, I come and I basically stuff my suitcase full of whatever you have because it's all so perfect. Some of that's local producers, some of that's companies that was, were started locally, um, and then some of that is just products that we feel um, are underrepresented here and also are just really fabulous. I spent a couple weeks this pandemic finding a way to get Duke's mayonnaise here in Tucson, oh, and that, yeah. that was my, my last big project, and I think it's paid off because we've always got a jar of it in our home now. We definitely, I think, have increased the amount of restaurants that are working with local farms, especially with Eric taking off and creating Pivot Produce. I think that was huge for Tucson. It's been good for Tucson. It's been good for everyone.